Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this day from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, some words are better when they're just hypothetical. Because once they become real, they never really feel normal in a conversation again. They become these little black holes that just suck away our breath while everybody else is just talking. Some words we like to keep purely hypothetical, like chemo, physical therapy, miscarriage, divorce, rehab. They're easy words to say, but if you've ever actually had to carry one of them, you know that they are a whole lot heavier than the syllables would seem to indicate. Like mercy. Mercy is one of those words that is better hypothetical. Because when you actually need it, it's different. Not mercy like the little favors that we ask of people we could totally do ourselves, but we're lazy and it makes life easy. Not even the kind of mercy that we'll pay you back for down the road. The real mercy, the I need helps that are so hard to say that you can't even lift your eyes up kind of mercy. The face fallen kind of mercy. The shame that is so heavy that leaves you feeling so worthless that to even look up hurts. Like everything you're trying to hold in might just come bursting out and everyone will see. All the desperation, all the guilt, all the debt. That kind of mercy is hard to talk about even after the fact because we're all pretty sure that even just talking about being that low will change how people will see us, even if it's years later. And that is by strangers. When it's somebody that you love and actually want to respect you, it's crippling. And so it makes us ignore our problems until they boil over in horrible, awful ways. It happened in the text today. Two men went up to the temple to pray. The first man, God named Cain. And he offered up of his own hard work the fruit of the ground. The second man, God called Abel. And he sacrificed the firstborn of his flock. And God was only pleased with Abel's offering. And we don't like thinking about that, so we usually just skip ahead until it's all too late and Abel's blood cries out from the ground so that we can learn, thou shalt not hit people with rocks, as if you needed Christianity to understand that concept. But still, that's where we start talking about Cain and Abel, instead of where it actually started, at the sacrifice, where Cain's anger was just a whole lot easier for him to feel than his hurts, but he couldn't lift his eyes up all the same. And the book never actually says why. And there's so much heartbreak and suffering wrapped up here that we almost just need it to start with Cain's bad intentions. Otherwise, we can never ever read it in hope again. And so we tell ourselves, well, maybe Cain just really didn't believe in God at all. Or maybe he didn't care and he only gave the cucumbers that were all weird shaped and bruised. Or maybe... God looked into Cain's heart and saw all of the evil there that would eventually bring him to kill his brother, and so he just rejected him out of hand before a whole thing could ever happen. Maybe God never loved Cain at all. Maybe God just hates vegetables. I don't know. Maybe we can't know. And that's the thing. That we just have to go through our lives wondering whether or not God will accept us. Wondering whether or not our half-baked intentions to totally be better Christians this week will actually be enough, or if those little doubts that eat at us really only prove that they won't be. And the book never tells us why. But this sacrifice has everything to do with how you expect to deal with God. See, if Cain just didn't do his very best, what's that say about us who tithe the same way? What's that say about us and all of our half-mumbled hymns that we pretend to sing? Or every time you thought about food because the prayers took too long afterwards, because, like, honestly, seven, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers is kind of excessive. Don't you think, Pastor? Like, we got places to be. It's a nice day. 
but the book doesn't say that. Still some people just assume. And if Cain just had something hidden in his heart that God saw and rejected him because of it, we're still in big trouble because as deep as we bury our shame, we still know exactly where it is. And so does God. But the book doesn't say that either. If God never loved some of us at all, why bother? I'd be like sitting all of your kids down for dinner and telling them all, there's one of you I don't love, but I'm not going to say who, just to see how that shapes the family dynamic in the future. That's, that's probably healthy, right? But the book doesn't say that. And if we can never actually know whether or not God is going to accept us, again, still trouble. Because we are either living our lives in constant fear of rejection or worse, trusting in something that's never going to work at all. And so when we read about the sacrifice and worry about the fact that it says nothing, we assume that that means everything. So I think Jesus gives us this parable so that we will better understand Cain and Abel. Two men go up to the temple to pray. A Pharisee who might maybe just hypothetically be named Cain. A tax collector who for the sake of this conversation we can call Abel. The Pharisee was actually ideal. These were not supervillains who twisted evil-looking mustaches while laughing maniacally as they planned to take over the world. These were the people who actually showed up to get things done in church. These were our elders. These are our church council. These are the people who tithed. These are the people who gave. These are the people who helped. If all of you behaved like him, my job outwardly would be really, really easy. We wouldn't have to talk about budgets because we would have coffers that overflow. We wouldn't have to talk about sin because all of you would stop doing stupid stuff. We would have a really pretty straightforward outward life of empty. And the tax collector was not a good guy. He made his money by breaking kneecaps. That, that's how they made their money. That's what it was. But the Pharisee was condemned, and the tax collector wasn't. Because the Pharisee offered of himself. The tax collector just begged for mercy. So ashamed that he could not even lift his eyes to heaven. He didn't just need, do me a solid mercy, or I'll pay you back later mercy. He needed something bigger than that. He needed the propitiation kind of mercy, the atoning kind of mercy, the kind of mercy that is expensive, too expensive to be paid in gold or silver, but must be paid in blood. But this is what our Lord gives. He closes the parable saying, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And here we can finally set aside Cain and his potentially good or bad intentions, which we would rather assume. And we can finally set aside our own intentions too, because in these words of Jesus, everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. We can finally realize that this is not about you. This is about Jesus for you. Christ who was exalted, humbled himself for you. Christ, who is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, creed God, that God, who ruled in the heavens and had no problems, he came down to earth for you. He was born of a virgin who is called things a lot worse than that for you. He walked through the mud, through the muck, through the mire, through the valley of the shadow of death, only to be cursed, mocked, beaten, and crucified, hung naked to die while people laughed at him for you. For me. He who was exalted was humbled, that we, we in our humiliation, would be called something else, forgiven, worthy of love, bought with a price that makes all of heaven sing hymns. Your sins are forgiven you because Jesus died for you. Thanks be to God. You are the most precious thing walking this earth. Because him who didn't ever need to dwell here chose to do so just to redeem you. Your worth is not found in your actions, but in his sacrifice. Christ, the exalted one, was crucified to bear your shame, pay your debts, and call you at your very lowest worthy. You have received mercy. You have received the kind of mercy that costs 
because Jesus paid it for you. That's our faith. We talk about it every week. And so if you want to understand Cain and Abel, maybe talk about the same thing and not something different. Start with the cross, because sin has always and only been paid for with blood. Nothing else can cover it. Not even the cucumbers that aren't all weird-shaped and bruised. That was even true back then, even for Cain and Abel. Cain gave of himself, but for Abel, something bled. Abel sought mercy, the propitiation in God's promise given to his mother, that there would be one born of a woman who would crush the head of the serpent forever, but would be broken in the process. Cain offered of himself. He tried to be the Messiah. Abel looked to one for help. He had faith. And yeah, Cain was a farmer, and Abel had animals. But it's not that life's not fair. They were brothers. You realize they could have, like, I don't know, traded. It's not that hard. Cain could have traded some tomatoes for an animal to sacrifice. It matters. Because what if there's a way to do church that isn't just try your very bestest for Jesus, but rather something will be given to bleed for you, to cover your sin and your shame. The thing is, what if God actually taught them how to sacrifice? And one of them just ignored it and said, Lord, here's how much I love you, my very best eggplant. And no, it doesn't actually say that God taught them how to sacrifice any more than it says that Cain didn't try his best or gave funny-looking carrots or any of the other things that we assume about him. But here's the thing. God did teach his people how to sacrifice everywhere else. And this particular story is in a book written by the very same guy that God used to teach the people of Israel who read that book, How to Sacrifice, Moses. And the scriptures don't present a mutable, changing God, but say over and over again that only by the shedding of blood can there be the forgiveness of sin. The thing is, we read our theology into these sacrifices. And so you can make a case for every single kind of righteousness inside of them. You can argue for double predestination. You can argue for works righteousness or the enthusiasm of really meaning in your heart or just Christ crucified to covered sins. The truth is, it says none of them explicitly. So you'll actually have to take what you learn in the rest of the book to figure this one out. And I do know that we cannot look into our own hearts to find salvation. Otherwise, when we need God the most, he always feels the farthest away. I do know that we cannot go by our best intentions because I've done some awful stupid stuff trying to do for good. I do know if all we want to let this rest on is our hearts, every last one of us will be secretly afraid of being non-Christian while we sit in the pews, side-eyeing everybody else. And I also know God didn't preemptively damn Cain. I know that the sacrifice wasn't something that Cain ignored. It mattered enough to him that he picked up a rock over it after it wasn't done, so it wasn't like he was just mailing it in. And I also know the lamb. The lamb is our everything. Because we know how heavy it is to need mercy, too. And it leaves us something to learn besides try your best and God hates vegetables. It leaves us something important. The idea that even though it doesn't seem possible, shame and faith can coexist. They have to. Because if you really think that you can hide your shame deep enough, it's only going to boil over sooner or later. And worse, it's not going to work. The Pharisee who stood there completely unashamed went home unjustified, unforgiven, unsaved. The tax collector, despite his shame, found mercy. So you who bury your shame like Abel's bones, know that God sees it. But no, you don't have to carry that burden yourself, for Christ has borne your shame for you. Ours is a religion that talks about a God who sees you at your lowest, everything that you would hide, and loves you in spite of it, and redeems you from it, and calls you holy and worthy of love by bearing that himself upon the cross. You who are afraid to lift your eyes to heaven, start with the cross, and there see your salvation and have hope. God does not hate you. God will not look into your heart to judge you. He has judged Christ. It is finished. You are forgiven. And he loves, his, he loves you enough to send his son to claim you. Because he who was humiliated on the cross is exalted, risen from the dead, so that even from our humiliation, we will rise exalted too. 
The blood has already been poured out, and it is here. It is for you, because the Lord is merciful. If you are ashamed, take drink. The Lord is merciful. If you are in need, take drink. The Lord is merciful. If everything is already boiled over and it is too late, the Lord is still merciful. For the Lord's blood cries out for you, and it cries mercy. It cries pardon paid for you at the highest cost, but only out of the purest love that washes away your shame. So kneel as the ones who were bought, who are loved, who are paid for, and meet the eyes of the Lord again. This is the truth that forgiveness offers you. This is the promise the blood makes you. You go home justified. Jesus says so. In the name of Jesus, amen.